Greetings to you on this day number 316. Welcome back, and I count it a great privilege and joy to share with you some of the greatest passages of Scripture. Today we have Daniel 5 and 6, Isaiah 25, and we read the last part of 2 Corinthians 5, leading to the first part of 2 Corinthians 6. Let's open to Daniel 5. Yesterday we heard two stories, that of Nebuchadnezzar's statue of gold and the exciting way God delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the second story was of Nebuchadnezzar himself sharing about his dream and how he was later humbled. Daniel 5 One night, King Belshazzar invited a thousand noblemen to a great banquet, and they drank wine together. While they were drinking, Belshazzar gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cups and bowls which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had carried off from the temple in Jerusalem. The king sent for them so that he, his noblemen, his wives, and his concubines could drink out of them. At once the gold cups and bowls were brought in, and they all drank wine out of them, and praised gods made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly a human hand appeared and began writing on the plaster wall of the palace, where the light from the lamps was shining most brightly, and the king saw the hand as it was writing. He turned pale and was so frightened that his knees began to shake. He shouted for someone to bring in the magicians, wizards, and astrologers. When they came in, the king said to them, Anyone who can read this writing and tell me what it means will be dressed in robes of royal purple, wear a gold chain of honor around his neck, and be the third power in the kingdom. The royal advisers came forward, but none of them could read the writing or tell the king what it meant. In his distress, King Belshazzar grew even paler, and his noblemen had no idea what to do. The queen mother heard this noise made by the king and his noblemen and entered the banquet hall. She said, "'May your majesty live forever!' Please do not be so disturbed and look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. When your father was king, this man showed good sense, knowledge, and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, made him chief of the fortune-tellers, magicians, wizards, and astrologers. He has unusual ability and is wise and skillful in interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining mysteries. So send for this man, Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar, and he will tell you what all this means. Daniel was brought at once into the king's presence, and the king said to him, Are you Daniel? that Jewish exile whom my father the king brought here from Judah. I have heard that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and you are skillful and have knowledge and wisdom. The advisers and magicians were brought in to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not discover the meaning. Now I have heard that you can find hidden meanings and explain mysteries. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be dressed in robes of royal purple, wear a gold chain of honor around your neck, and be the third in power in the kingdom. Daniel replied, Keep your gifts for yourself or give them to someone else. I will read for your majesty what has been written and tell you what it means. The supreme God made your father, Nebuchadnezzar, a great king and gave him dignity and majesty. He was so great that people of all nations, races, 
and languages were afraid of him and trembled. If he wanted to kill someone, he did. If he wanted to keep someone alive, he did. He honored or disgraced anyone he wanted to. But because he became proud, stubborn, and cruel, he was removed from his royal throne and lost his place of honor. He was driven away from human society, and his mind became like that of an animal. He lived with wild donkeys, ate grass like an ox, and slept in the open air with nothing to protect him from the dew. Finally, he admitted that the supreme God controls all human kingdoms and can give them to anyone he chooses. But you, his son, have not humbled yourself, even though you knew all this. You acted against the Lord of heaven and brought in the cups and bowls taken from his temple. You, your noblemen, your wives, and your concubines drank wine out of them and praised gods made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, gods that cannot see or hear and that do not know anything. But you did not honor the God who determines whether you live or die and who controls everything you do. That is why God has sent the hand to write these words. This is what was written. Number, number, weight, divisions. And this is what it means. Number. God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Wait. You have been weighed on the scales and found to be too light. Divisions. Your kingdom is divided up and given to the Medes and Persians. Immediately Belshazzar ordered his servants to dress Daniel in a robe of royal purple and to hang a gold chain of honor around his neck, and he made him the third in power in the kingdom. That same night Belshazzar, the king of Babylonia, was killed, and Darius the Mede, who was then sixty-two years old, seized the royal power. Daniel 6 Darius decided to appoint a hundred and twenty governors to hold office throughout his empire. In addition, he chose Daniel and two others to supervise the governors and to look after the king's interests. Daniel soon showed that he could do better work than the other supervisors or the governors. Because he was so outstanding, the king considered putting him in charge of the whole empire. Then the other supervisors and the governors tried to find something wrong with the way Daniel administered the empire, but they couldn't, because Daniel was reliable and did not do anything wrong or dishonest. They said to each other, we aren't going to find anything of which to accuse Daniel unless it is something in connection with his religion. So they went to see the king and said, King Darius, may your majesty live forever. All of us who administer your empire, the supervisors, the governors, the lieutenant governors, and the other officials, have agreed that your majesty should issue an order and enforce it strictly. Give orders that for thirty days no one is permitted to request anything from any god or from any human being except from your majesty. Any one who violates this order is to be thrown into a pit filled with lions. So let your majesty issue this order and sign it, and it will be in force, a law of the Medes and Persians which cannot be changed. And so King Darius signed the order. When Daniel learned that the order had been signed, he went home. In an upstairs room of his house there were windows that faced toward Jerusalem. 
There, just as he had always done, he knelt down at the open windows and prayed to God three times a day. When Daniel's enemies observed him praying to God, all of them went together to the king to accuse Daniel. They said, Your Majesty, you signed an order that for thirty days anyone who requested anything of any god or from any human being except you would be thrown into a pit filled with lions. The king replied, Yes, that is a strict order, a law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be changed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, one of the exiles from Judah, does not respect your majesty or obey the order you issued. He prays regularly, three times a day. When the king heard this, he was upset and did his best to find some way to rescue Daniel. He kept trying until sunset. Then Daniel's enemies came back to the king and said to him, Your majesty knows that, according to the laws of the Medes and Persians, no order which the king issues can be changed. So the king gave orders for Daniel to be taken and thrown into the pit filled with lions. He said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve so loyally, rescue you. A stone was put over the mouth of the pit, and the king placed his own royal seal and the seal of his noblemen on the stone, so that no one could rescue Daniel. Then the king returned to the palace and spent a sleepless night without food or any form of entertainment. At dawn the king got up and hurried to the pit. When he got there, he called out anxiously, Daniel! Servant of the living God, was the God you serve so loyally able to save you from the lions? Daniel answered, May your majesty live forever. God sent his angel to shut the mouths of the lions so that they would not hurt me. He did this because he knew I was innocent and because I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders for Daniel to be pulled up out of the pit. So they pulled him up and saw that he had not been hurt at all, for he trusted God. Then the king gave orders to arrest all those who had accused Daniel, and he had them thrown, together with their wives and children, into the pit filled with lions. Before they even reached the bottom of the pit, The lions pounced on them and broke all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to the people of all nations, races, and languages on earth, Greetings! I command that throughout my empire everyone should fear and respect Daniel's God. He is a living God, and he will rule forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his power will never come to an end. He saves and rescues. He performs wonders and miracles in heaven and on earth. He saved Daniel from being killed by the lions. Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Let's turn to Isaiah 25. Yesterday's reading in Isaiah talked of the destruction of the whole earth, but here again, as typical in Isaiah, the sun was allowed to break through the clouds. We look forward to a city where God himself will outshine the sun. Isaiah 25 Heading A Hymn of Praise Lord, you are my God. I will honor you and praise your name. You have done amazing things. You have faithfully carried out the plans you made long ago. You have turned cities into ruins and destroyed their fortifications. 
The palaces which our enemies built are gone forever. The people of powerful nations will praise you. You will be feared in the cities of cruel nations. The poor and the helpless have fled to you and have been safe in times of trouble. You give them shelter from storms and shade from the burning heat. Cruel enemies attack like a winter storm, like drought in a dry land. But you, Lord, have silenced our enemies. You silence the shouts of cruel people as a cloud cools a hot day. Heading God prepares a banquet. Here on Mount Zion, the Lord Almighty will prepare a banquet for all the nations of the world, a banquet of the richest food and the finest wine. Here he will suddenly remove the cloud of sorrow that has been hanging over the nations. The Sovereign Lord will destroy death forever. He will wipe away the tears from everyone's eyes and take away the disgrace his people have suffered throughout the world. The Lord himself has spoken. When it happens, everyone will say, He is our God, we have put our trust in him, and he has rescued us. He is the Lord, we have put our trust in him, and now we are happy and joyful because he has saved us. Heading God will punish Moab. The Lord will protect Mount Zion, but the people of Moab will be trampled down the way straw is trampled in manure. They will reach out their hands as if they were trying to swim, but God will humiliate them, and their hands will sink helplessly. He will destroy the fortresses of Moab with their high walls, and bring them tumbling down into the dust. And now let's return to Second Corinthians 5. Here is part of Paul's discussion about the earthly tents, or bodies, we all have, and heavenly bodies we will one day have. Chapter 5, verse 6. So we are always full of courage. We know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord's home. For our life is a matter of believing, not of seeing. We are full of courage and would much prefer to leave our home in the body and be at home with the Lord. More than anything else, however, we want to please Him, whether in our home here or there. And now we pick up in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. Paul returns to his theme about the apostolic ministry that God has given to him and his companions and especially now their commission to share the message of reconciliation with God. 2 Corinthians 5 We are ruled by the love of Christ, now that we recognize that one man has died for everyone, which means that they all share in his death. He died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but only for him who died and was raised to life for their sake. No longer then do we judge anyone by human standards. Even if at one time we judged Christ according to human standards, we no longer do so. Anyone who is joined to Christ is a new being. The old is gone. The new has come. And the source of all those life changes is God himself, who by Christ's mediation has made us at peace with himself. Then he sent us out to tell about that offer of peace. What we tell is that God, 
through the death of Christ, has opened the way for each person in this world to be at peace with him. For those of us who are joined as one with Christ, God no longer counts our sins and wrongdoings against us. That's the news of restored peace that God entrusted to us. It means that we've become messengers of Christ, our King. Through us, God is inviting and calling each of you to listen to this message. In Christ Jesus' name, be restored to peace with God. Christ was without sin, but for our sake God made him share our sin, in order that in union with him we might share the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 6 In our work together with God, then, we beg you who have received God's grace not to let it be wasted. Hear what God says. When the time came for me to show you favor, I heard you. When the day arrived for me to save you, I helped you. Listen, this is the hour to receive God's favor. Today is the day to be saved. We do not want anyone to find fault with our work, so we try not to put obstacles in anyone's way. Instead, in everything we do, we show that we are God's servants by patiently enduring troubles, hardships, and difficulties. We have been beaten, jailed, and mobbed. We have been overworked and have gone without sleep or food. By our purity, knowledge, patience, and kindness, we have shown ourselves to be God's servants, by the Holy Spirit, by our true love, by our message of truth, and by the power of God. We have righteousness as our weapon, both to attack and to defend ourselves. We are honored and disgraced. We are insulted and praised. We are treated as liars, yet we speak the truth. We're treated as unknown, yet we are known by all. People act as though we were dead, but as you see, we live on. Although punished, we are not killed. Although saddened, we are always glad. We seem poor, but we make many people rich. We seem to have nothing, yet we really possess everything. Dear friends in Corinth, we have spoken frankly to you. We have opened our hearts wide. It is not we who have closed our hearts to you. It's you who have closed your hearts to us. I speak now as though you were my children. Show us the same feelings that we have for you. Open your hearts wide. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I feel certain that my listener joins me in praying that we ourselves and everyone we know would not waste your generous offer of grace and favor. Just like we heard in Hebrews, today is a special day. This is the day of salvation. May we enter more fully through the narrow gate and go further in. And may you give us strength to be your messengers about the life transformation and the reconciliation you offer through union with Christ. Today again we take up our cross to follow Jesus. For his sake, and the sake of the glorious message of peace with you, Heavenly Father, we are willing to be dishonored, disgraced, treated as liars, ignored, shunned, and even punished.